You've written TV scripts, musicals, plays, operas. You've received too many awards to count. Tell me, what's one single word that describes you? Um, I think hopeful. I mean, I, I guess I continue to hope that I can be better, like a better writer, a better artist, better person, whatever. He's invested in not only the work, but also in being a good human. And I think that that element of, I mean, his, his humanity and his compassion is, is part of what makes him a great writer. David Henry Huang, you began writing when most kids were riding bicycles. Tell me what that first thing was that you wrote about and why you were inspired to write at such a young age. Um, yeah, I was 10 years old and my uh, maternal grandmother fell ill and she was the one who knew all the family history. And for some reason at that age I felt like if she died we would of course lose my grandmother but we would also lose all these stories. So I asked my parents if I could spend a summer with her. Um, I was born and raised in LA, she was living in the Philippines, uh, and I went over and we did what would now be called oral histories. Um, I got a lot of her stories on cassette, then I came back to the States and kind of compiled them into a 90-page non-fiction novel about the history of my family. Well, tell me about the theme that threads through that first work. It was kind of about how the, the, the family kind of um, uh, amassed a certain amount of, uh, I guess, money and, and, and you know, was sort of financially successful, and then how that kind of split everyone in the family apart, how the money uh, um, dissolved the family bonds. and. Um, the play that we're doing here at Signature, um, Golden Child, is actually based on that uh, novel I wrote when I was 10. So I wrote the play in my late 30s, and it became about um, my great-grandfather's conversion to Christianity in the 1920s in China, and the effect that that had on his three wives, because Chinese men were polygamous back then. So you know he became a Christian, but it's like, oh, what are you, what's he going to do with his wives? Will you talk a little bit about what you called fresh off the boat, FOBs, versus people who are well established already in a Western society? How did that play into, how did those themes play into the, into the works? Yeah, uh, my first play was called FOB, for fresh off the boat, and it was kind of about the conflict between um, FOBs, like new immigrants from Asia, China specifically, and ABCs, or American-born Chinese. And I think it really reflected the degree to which those of us who are ABCs um, at that point, particularly, and this was in the kind of 1970s, felt um, somewhat embarrassed by the FOBs because we had been, uh, you know, worked very hard to kind of assimilate and be just like other Americans. And that covered up a certain amount of um, self hatred, um, self loathing, that then when we saw new immigrants, we were very uncomfortable with them. So, in a way, FOB is. Uh, an indictment of the ABCs. It's an indictment of the way that people like me try to uh, be sort of 100 percent American, whatever that meant, uh, and gave up a lot uh, and uh, in, in, involved with our own kind of self-loathing. Well, tell me, if you don't mind, did that play into your family? Was there a big feeling of that in your family in particular? Did you have that sort of struggle between FOB, uh, American-born Chinese? Mm. I mean, within my own family, um, I think, you know, my parents were very interested in our, uh, their, their children actually not knowing, uh, not being particularly Chinese and being more assimilationist and being more American, whatever that meant. And part of that was the times. Um, you know, I, w I grew up basically in the 1960s and this whole notion of kind of ethnic identity uh, wasn't really that prominent. Uh, and then also my mother, I think because she came from a very um, Christian family, that was sort of their values as opposed to Chinese values. So I didn't know, for instance, when Chinese New Year was, even that sort of thing. And so a lot of my adult life has been trying to learn some of the things that I didn't know when I was a kid. Well, I think David holds a very unique position. I think he's both at home and um, a foreigner, both here in this country and in China, and by having his foot in both places and neither place. It is um, a, a unique position for him and I think 
um, gives him great insight into both cultures, actually. Tell me how your parents impacted you then on, you start writing these things, um, they probably um, struck a chord mm -hmm. uh, with, with your family. How did your parents react to? Well, you know, my f um, father was, he didn't really know what to make of the fact that I wanted to be a playwright. And um, he, uh, but, you know, I got good grades in college, so it didn't really matter what I did in my spare time. But when I wrote this play, FOB, um, I wrote it to be done in my dorm initially. And so my father read it, and he'd never read a play before, and he was like, oh, I, you know, he saw some swear words, and he was like, I send you to this fancy school, and you write this junk. But he also told my mom, well, let's go up and see it. Mm. And if it's good, we'll encourage him, and if it's bad, we'll tell him to stop. And a lot of the immigrant stories in that play, FOB, um, you know, some of them were derived from my father's stories. And at the end of the play, In the Dorm, he, he was like in tears and you know, really? he was very moved by the play. And after that, he was quite supportive. And I think that says a lot and give them a lot of credit for being kind of Chinese immigrant parents who kind of accepted the notion that their um, only son uh, wanted to become a playwright. David's really generous. He's generous with me, he's generous with the actors, he's generous as a person in the world. He is able to listen and understand and he's perceptive, he's compassionate. And I think it's been very rewarding and lovely to build not only a working relationship with him but a real friendship with him and one in which there's so much honesty and so much trust because there has to be to throw ourselves over the edge every time sort of working on a new show. So you want that person who you're with to be, you know, holding your hand as much as you're holding theirs. Coming to work, being with him, um, helping him figure out the next play that he wants to write. It's that kind of collaboration, which is the reason that I became a director, to be able to work with a writer of his abilities and to feel inspired by them and challenged by them. And um, it's been a real amazing part of my career. In a funny way, the time that I realized I was going to be a writer for the rest of my life was the first time I had a failure. Um, I did mm. three or four plays off-Broadway that were successful, and then I did a play that flopped. And that was when, when that happened, and I, I went, oh, well, you know, it's not successful, but I'm st it's still really important to me that I did it, and I'm glad that I did it. That was when I knew I was always going to be a writer, because it's easy to keep writing when things are going well. What's important is to learn from your failures, and I think if we don't fail, we're not working hard enough. David and I met right after he finished the draft of uh, Yellow Face, which he had been working on. It was his first new play in 10 years after doing his musicals Aida and Tarzan and been working with Disney and he was um, getting back to writing plays and we had sort of a awkward first date and uh, and he said, what do, you, what do you think about the play? And I said, oh, I really love it. And he said, what do you think it's about? And I told him and he said, yeah, you know, I don't really think it's about that. I think it's this other kind of play. And I thought, oh no. And, um, and then the next day he called me and he said, I don't think you totally got it, but you were really honest. And I think you misunderstood it in ways that I need to make better in the play. And it was the beginning of a, a collaboration that has been very honest, very rigorous, full of questions back and forth with each other. And um, it was actually kind of the perfect way for us to start because we're all the time saying, does that make sense? Should we try this? Should I try this? And questioning each other and looking for, um, the best idea. Tell me about Golden Child because that's undergone quite a few revisions. In mm -hmm. fact, it has a new director. Um, you first produced it in the 90s, is that right? Yeah, in the late 90s. Yeah. So tell me about that transition and that sort of change and the, and the writing. Well, um, Golden Child, uh, yes, we premiered it initially off-Broadway, then it uh, toured uh, to a lot of different theaters, then it uh, came to Broadway in, the, uh, in 98. Um, and I think any play, um, I really believe in rewriting. So I have a first draft, but it's just the beginning. And um, I change it a lot in rehearsal, and I change it a lot in front of audiences. Um, and then eventually it opens in New York, and then that's kind of set. But in this particular case, uh, we had the opportunity to um, 
redo it and do a, a new version of it here at Signature. David, I think, was reluctant to do a revival or revivals of his past plays because I think there was some anxiety around it. And I think he um, was nervous about it and, and, and um, anxious to sort of revisit something that happened um, so many years ago. And I feel like his discomfort has really subsided and that actually now he's been really enjoying himself. Sometimes you do a revival of a play and you don't change anything. In this particular case, there, was, there were two sections of the play that I never really felt I got right. So part of the opportunity of doing it at Signature um, is, the, uh, is a chance to, to relook at that. Um, and the fact that it's a new director and a new production, that's pretty much par for the course when you do a revival. You usually don't have the original director mm. simply reproduce the original production. But the opportunity to do a little more rewriting is, is kind of unique. Uh, often in new play development and in, in, a, in a project like this, the writer will be in rehearsals and will try things in rehearsal that will be inspiring or it will, will make them say, oh, that doesn't actually make any sense at all. I should change that. And that process goes on through all of rehearsals. And then often once you get in front of an audience and it's like, oh, that joke, we thought that joke was funny, that joke's not funny, new joke, write something new. Or, oh, the end didn't work or that scene didn't work. And sometimes it's more drastic. Sometimes it's three or four scenes get totally rewritten. So um, he's been with us every day in rehearsal and been doing a lot of rewriting. and. Um, I think trying to keep the essence, the beautiful, beautiful essence of the play intact while um, changing things that maybe he didn't have a chance to change the first time around. Tell me what was the most challenging about rewriting Golden Child? It's a play that starts basically in the present and then it goes back to 1918 in China and, then, and that's where most of the play takes place and then it ends again in the present. And it's those two kind of bookends that mm -hmm. take place in the present that I just kept on rewriting and rewriting, rewriting throughout the entire process in the late 90s and never really felt I got right. So there was something, I was a little nervous about coming back into it and going, okay, if I'm gonna take this on again, am I finally gonna be able to get it right or is it just going to be you know, a frustrating experience again? And at the moment, you know, I feel like um, I have gotten it right, so that's satisfying. Well, you certainly don't seem like someone uh, anyone would describe as nervous. How did you ever overcome that, that barrier? The, the thing about being a writer, and being a playwright in particular, is you're not the one on stage. Hmm. So I, I mean, I do get nervous when uh, the first time I hear the play, the first time the play's in front of an audience, certainly when critics start coming, or opening night and we're, we're wait, waiting for the reviews. Those are all kind of nerve-wracking moments. But fortunately, I can go someplace else. I can sit in the back of the theater. I can go to a bar. I can, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of options that a writer has. That you know, the the, the thing that I admire is the actors because they're really the soldiers on the front lines. And it doesn't matter if they're nervous. And it doesn't matter if they got bad reviews the day before. They're going up that night and they're going to perform the show and do the best they can. What's your biggest hope for Golden Child? I hope that this new version um, feels satisfying to everyone. It's, you know, first to me, which I think it does at the moment, and then to audiences and, you know, maybe even critics, and that this would be a version that I'd be able to um, make available to other theaters to do, and that some people might choose to do the old version and some people might choose to do this version. I think it's just a great opportunity to see this play again after um, about 15 years. Golden Child is really a very personal play for David. The play opens with a grandson visiting his grandmother, wanting to know the family story, and the grandmother being uh, reluctant to tell him. And then we go back in time to China, 1918, and um, we meet our main character, Tian Bin, and his three wives and his daughter, and we watch them struggle with the idea of progress and getting rid of the bound feet and struggling with what religion they should be and um, as in many of David's plays characters who are on the precipice of change and um, I think that David really wanted to explore how did his family come to Christianity and what was that moment like in his in his family history and I think this story of David's family this story of this family um, in China um, is, is one that is both um, specific to that time and that culture, but also very universal because it's about how all families 
shift and change and the decisions that we make that moves us forward, but they also, you know, progress will always have cost. And I think David is able to capture that in Golden Child beautifully. Let's talk about the future. If you could choose one medium, whether it's playwright, uh, TV scripts, whatever it is, what is the medium, what's your favorite medium? Uh, well, plays are my most personal medium because in the theater, um, I have the opportunity to be the person who has sort of the primary artistic vision and everybody tries to support that. Um, there are some, jo you know, there are joys that if I work in a movie, I'm working for the director. If I'm um, wor working on an opera, I'm working for the composer. And there's advantages to that too. Uh, and those can be wonderful experiences. But the most personal, the, 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 the medium where I get to say what's uh, deepest in my own heart um, f for me is theater. Well, tell me about risk. Is there a risk that you haven't yet taken professionally that you would really like to take? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been feeling lately, and this sort of contradicts what I just said, but <laughs> I've been feeling lately that um, I've, I haven't worked in television really. Um, I've worked in, um, I've, re I've re read a miniseries once that wasn't very good, but um, for, in terms of series television, I've, series television is really, quite wonderful now. You know, there's so many good shows on. Mm. And um, that's something they haven't done, and I might want to do that at some point in my life. Well, just working with him and getting to see him every day and being um, a very steady collaborator of his, I now feel like I have a greater understanding of how the inside of his brain works, which is kind of amazing. Tell me about the vision that you see for your work, whether it has to do with a broader fan base of Asian Americans or whether it's something totally different? For me, it's just project to project, um, particularly in the theater. And um, I, with every show, um, you know, there's a story that I'm interested in, but I also try to do something new form-wise. And it's like, what, what excites me um, that I haven't done before in the theater? So for instance, um, the third show that we're doing here at Signature will be uh, my new play called Kung, Kung Fu, Fu, and it's about Bruce Lee. But one of the things that I wanted to do with it is to try and create a show that's basically a play with dance. So um, it's like a musical in that it has live music and um, it has uh, dances, but it doesn't have songs. Um, and that's something that I haven't really seen before, so I'm just curious to see if, you know, like to try and make that. Um, and I think every play for me is about that. It's about trying to, to play with the form and challenge myself and do something new. Um, and I don't have a larger goal than that. It's really just to continue to um, get to um, see what else I can do in this world called theater. Well, you're constantly challenging the convention, it I'm sounds trying, like. Yeah. That's wonderful, thank you. Thank you. On this week's We Talk Shorts, we find out one prominent artist's terrific solution to help raise money for Hurricane Sandy victims, and we check out how the Williamsburg diners are putting their money where their mouth is for the aftermath of one of the East Coast's worst storms. While there are so many people donating their clothes after the Hurricane Sandy in New York, there are others who are creating. Meet Sebastian Ehazudis, designer and sculptor, born in Chile, based in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, who created tie-dye inventive shirts to raise money for donation. So we had a whole week where I couldn't work and all I was doing instead was watching television, seeing all these horrendous stories. And I was just, I don't know, drumming my fingers, trying to come up with an idea. And it occurred to me that the I Love New York t-shirt was the one logo that everyone identifies with. And at the same time, when you saw all the line wa uh, uh, of the water, that was left in all the walls, especially on the art galleries, that you could see the line that went all the way up to five feet. There was a very distinct, very powerful phenomenon of what had happened, a reminder of the level which the water had arrived. The reminder of death within your life as a way to also uh, remember how important life is and be able to liberate yourself from the daily things that tie you down and to be able to see the big picture. His collection called I Still Love New York features the traditional I Love New York designs and also the subway map featuring the blackout that New Yorkers had to deal with and the response from the public was fantastic. I expected to sell 50 t-shirts to my art collectors and a few fans and that was it. 
And it's been so crazy that we immediately had to post online that we would be looking at a two week delay at least. I do mostly design and, f and furniture in uh, woodwork and steelwork. I don't do t-shirts, I've never done this before. So we're trying to do the best thing possible. We're so thankful for the help. And, and that's it, now we need pros. 100% of the proceeds are going to Cherry. The t-shirts are selling for $40 on shopgrayarea.com. But the critically acclaimed artist says that with the high demand, they will be costing a lot less soon. Reporting for Sign of Vision, this is Livia Arias. While most people don't associate eating out with helping others, everybody's all about it here today. The Williamsburg Night Out is an event created to help out the victims of Hurricane Sandy, and most restaurants are participating and doing their best to help. Making a business boom from a natural disaster, many restaurants in the Williamsburg, Brooklyn, decided to donate 10 to 20 percent of gross sales on November 8th to the Red Cross. But we're all a little bit overwhelmed and so excited because restaurants have been really eager to join. We have people all the way up to today still joining on as they hear about the event. Um, thus far we have 61 people, 61 restaurants and cafes in the northern Brooklyn area. New Yorkers do best definitely in times of crisis. Um, since 9-11 when I was here you've just watched and seen as a city we come together and amazingly well. Organizer and owner of two participating business, a coffee shop and a wine store, Talita says the turnout is already positive. We hope that there are lots of people walking around the Williamsburg neighborhood and Greenpoint as well. Let's not forget all of our friends in Greenpoint. Um, at Champion Coffee and at Vine Wine, I know it was really busy at Champion this morning, um, which is in the north end of Greenpoint, and I hope that that's because people were excited to spend money and to have an extra cookie or something for dine out. Um, and I hope tonight that we'll just have a, few, a little bit higher foot traffic and that people will be excited. She confided that if they meet the expectations, this could even become a regular thing. But don't forget, if you can go out to help, you can make donations at any time. Reporting for Sign of Vision, this is Livia Arias. Winter is approaching in New York, and that means breaking out the coat and mittens. For the Victoria's Secret fashion show models, it's the time of year to bear it all. The 2012 Victoria's Secret fashion show premiered at New York's Lexington Armory on Wednesday. Backstage, we caught up with Angel Dutes and Crows to see how she prepared to strut her stuff. I eat like really balanced and like uh, vegetables and fish. There's always a lot of pressure and I work out a lot before. While VS show veterans Isabelle Fontana and Dutes and Crows have been on the runway for a combined 17 years, they're looking forward to modeling this year's looks Angel style. I'm going to be wearing a corset. And it's really nice with um, uh, like a corset wings. It's a pink corset wings. And it's very, very romantic, but like a fatal. And no, Victoria's Secret model would be complete without the effortlessly flawless makeup. Makeup artist Tom Bichu shares his secrets for creating angel worthy looks. I think we leave the eyebrow very natural. A lot of uh, mascara, a little bit of black and brown to frame the eyes on the top. Only brown under the eyes. As the models and backstage teams make their final preparations before they go on stage, it's obvious that they're grateful to participate in a fun and unique show. So when you do a fashion show, you are selling clothes. When you do a VS show, it's the show. Because it's such a special show. Everybody wants to be here. Everybody wants to watch it. It brings hope for everyone. The Victoria's Secret Fashion Show airs on December 4th on CBS. Next week on We Talk, we sit down with two prominent figures of the New York branch of collaboration, find out how this nonprofit is making a priceless impact on the Asian American entertainment community.